first thing you got to do is sit down and look at all the components that go into a huge performance, into getting bigger, stronger, and faster. And they're pretty simple. It's just optimizing each of them and paying a lot of attention to them. Eat, sleep, and train. And trying to make sure each of those components are optimized. And the other one I throw in there is hormones. It's a completely different and separate discipline that I think is extremely important, and it's affected by a lot of your eat, sleeping, and training. So those are the four circles that I put up usually when I map out what I want to optimize, and I create a hierarchy of the things that are most important. As I do in business, I call them action items. If I want to succeed, I have to do these things well and consistently. And for me, it was always eat, sleep, train, and hormones. Uh, and just being honest about it, when I competed, performance enhancing drugs, uh, I, you know, they're involved in the sports. And uh, most, all the people I competed against, I mean, I was in the IFBB, so everybody I competed against was also using performance enhancing drugs. And I competed in untested federations. Now that doesn't mean that that's something that you have to do, or I'm suggesting you do, but you still have to pay attention to and optimize your hormones for performance. It's a huge component. Not to talk about it's irresponsible. Um, not condoning or su supporting performance enhancing drugs, but what I'm saying is that even as a natural athlete, that's a critical element, and you should pay attention to how you can improve those uh, naturally if that's your choice, but they're very important for performance. To be specific, if you are low in thyroid, and you want to get lean to compete in a bodybuilding or physique show, good luck to you. It's not going to happen. And anybody, you, whatever program you embark on that doesn't include optimizing your thyroid uh, hormone levels uh, is going to fail. If you're low in testosterone and you want to be bigger, stronger, faster, good luck to you. It's not going to happen. It's a key component. It's critical that you optimize that, either naturally or through supplementation. It's your choice. But I'm saying either way, you need to pay attention to it. It's a critical component in the absence of optimizing that. Your performance is going to suffer and you'll never reach the level that you want to reach. And I think if you're a coach coaching athletes, that not to disclose or address that important aspect of their training is irresponsible. And you're possibly just stealing someone's money if you don't get in there and say, look, you need to make sure that these things are optimized. So we start, I start with a blood test. You guys, many of you who've watched my stuff know how, how much I keep harping on this. It's important. A very comprehensive blood test. And those of you who haven't had one, I suggest you get one immediately. Because there's so many things that happen in that blood test that can drastically improve your performance now. So the first thing I did with Hofthor Bjornsson, we got a blood test. I found some significant deficiencies that we were able to remedy. Uh, the first and foremost being vitamin D. He lives in Iceland. It's a no-brainer, right? Vitamin D, and I've done plenty of rants on this. You guys have probably heard about this ad nauseum as well. If it's not something you're paying attention to, you need to find out if you're deficient, remedy that deficiency, because it has such a huge impact on hormones in your body, such as potentially thyroid, certainly insulin, definitely sleep, uh, and uh, insulin sensitivity. There's another one of Hawthorne's problems is he was insulin resistant. He found himself a little bit over 400 pounds, 420, uh, and he was putting on more fat than muscle at the time and not getting stronger what we call nutrient partitioning, the way we use the foods we eat, depends upon your insulin sensitivity. Are you going to use those nutrients for glycogen storage for the muscles? Uh, are you going to use those nutrients for protein uh, repair, for muscle repair? Or is your body going to store them as fat because it's insulin resistant and your insulin's shuttling all those nutrients into fat storage as quickly as possible because it's trying to get that, your blood sugars and insulin level down. It's another huge problem with Hofthor at the time is that he was insulin resistant, he was vitamin D deficient. Fortunately, they're correlated. Uh, you improve vitamin D, you improve insulin resistance. Another big component that I did with him, um, that's kind of really all I need to talk about in terms of hormones is that you need to get tested, you need to optimize those. And uh, some of the most important things you can do naturally is improve uh, deficiencies such as vitamin D, blood sugars. Then we'll go to sleep. Sleep was enormous. I think it's the most important thing. If that's the one thing that you're currently having a problem with in your uh, current training regimen, 
uh, that's the most important thing you should fix. I would rather have you skip a workout to get a good night's sleep. It's so common. If a guy like me who after 30 years of competing, who's spent tens of thousands, if not hundreds, and traveled all over the world and worked with some of the biggest names, coaches, and athletes in the world, tells you that the single most important thing that you can do is sleep, I would hope you would take that seriously. And I, I don't mean to belabor the point, and, uh, but it's of all the secrets that I've looked for, all the rocks I've turned, all the drug cycles I've had people proclaim to be the next greatest thing, all the macro percentages that uh, you know everybody's talked about, whatever fancy food item, what have you, training program, percentage load, split, whatever, pales in comparison to that one key component. That's, that's at the pinnacle, that is at the hierarchy, the top single most important thing that affects everything downstream. It's something I've done very, very well since I was in college. I didn't hang out at the parties. Everybody knew I was you know, a killjoy because my chariot turned into a pumpkin at 10 p.m. because I knew I had to get up in the morning and train. In college, you have to train in the morning, usually. And that was the single most thing, I think, the biggest difference is I slept a lot. And I got bigger and stronger every single week. The more I slept, ate, hydrated, uh, the better my training sessions were consistently and compounding over years. It just kept building on itself. Suspicious, um, you kind of got to get to an HRT doctor that has some sports background. I've, yeah. the, one of the guys I deal with in Las Vegas used to be a competitive powerlifter, yeah. and he's a doctor. So he understands, he knows, and it's not weird to him. Yeah. And when he looks at the blood tests, he sees when your AST, LT enzymes are 1.5 times normal, he, he thinks that's normal for somebody who lifts weights. Uh, so you, gotta, you do have to find the right guy, get the right information, that's for sure. And uh, I've been through probably 20 different HRT doctors in the last 25 years. I, I've talked before about the fact that I, I was, uh, had delayed onset puberty in, in high school. I was 17 years old because I wasn't sleeping. I was working till midnight, one o'clock in the morning, and I was working at 7-Eleven, and I was eating their nachos with the pump cheese and soda. That, that's what I lived on. And that's why I was 100 pounds till I was 17 years old. I was just a scrawny little kid. And then when I went back to Pennsylvania my senior year over Christmas break to work with my uncle on his farm for six months, and we ate raw milk, eggs, lard, bacon, uh, you know, all the whole foods. Uh, I put on 30 pounds just like that. And, uh, you know, so it, again, why hormones are so important, why diet's so important, why sleep's so important. Uh, you know, even at that level, I started to understand that. So, um, again, I don't want to blame it to the point, but let me give you some, a few key things about sleep. Uh, it's not just any old sleep, but I did a rant recently on this. It's, it's deep sleep, which means that it has to be very dark in the room or your brain's not going to release melatonin because there's a light on. It's just a fact. That's what works. It has to be consistent with the normal circadian rhythms, which you don't get to control. Those are generally 10 p.m. to 5 or 6 a.m. or 11 p.m. to 5 or 6 a.m. You need to sleep during those hours. If you work nights, I'm sorry. You know, you're not going to fix that problem through compensation. It's just not going to be optimal. Uh, every hour you get to sleep before midnight is like two hours in the bank. So I started trying to get to sleep as close to 10 o'clock as I could. I started shutting down the lights a little early, uh, not being in my phone right up to the time I went to bed. Um, I would take a 10-minute walk after I ate my last meal of the night, help calm my stomach, help you know, prepare me for bed. Um, uh, I would also make sure it was quiet, as quiet as could be, or I'd wear headphones. And I recommended to athletes that have kids or dogs or whatever that they wear some sort of headphones or earplugs that are comfortable to them. And with Hofthor, the CPAP. Yeah, people who lift tend to have thicker necks, which tends to be a significant contributor to sleep apnea. And if you're waking up tired uh, and you don't know whether or not you're snoring or holding your breath, uh, it, it may very well be that's the cause. Uh, so we started Hofthor with the CPAP, improved his sleep, got his vitamin D up, and immediately energy levels and performance started improving. So that's a huge component, sleep. I can't say enough of all the money I've spent and the research I've done and the, the traveling and people I've, I've worked with. That still goes to the very top of the list. Everything starts from there. So if you want to optimize that, 
you might be able to, you know, uh, be a little less disciplined somewhere else, but that's not the place to cut corners. I see it too in terms of metabolism for people who are trying to lose weight uh, and get ready for competitions. I prep a lot of people for all kinds of physique, bikini, bodybuilding uh, figure. And that's the number one thing that we try and fix immediately because it drastically improves your metabolism and your thyroid function. Uh, so you repair better and faster by getting into that deeper sleep for longer periods of time. And it uh, uh, improves insulin sensitivity uh, and in improves thyroid function. So make sure that, that you optimize that, get as much as you can. Ideally, it's gonna be over seven hours. When, when I trained with Mark, I stayed at a hotel here in town and I was sleeping probably eight and a half plus because the training was so intense at the time and I was so heavy uh, that I just needed more. So it's gonna be based on, you know, certainly maybe on your mass and your workload too. You might need more and as you're training heavier and harder going into a competition, you may need a little more sleep and couple that with a 20 minute nap in the afternoon. And I say 20 minutes because you go beyond that, you might end up getting into REM sleep, wake up groggy for hours. So it's not intended, a 20 minute nap isn't intended to be sleep per se. It just helps kind of recharge you for your energy levels. So that's, that's, those are two of the biggies, the hormones and the sleep. The training part, we'll leave that for another day. Uh, you guys have obviously lots of great resources for that and coaches as far as uh, prepping for meets, etc. I will say this in very short order is that uh, Eddie Cohn always approached his training with uh, short blocks broken up by uh, deload times. And so he would do four weeks of increasing load and then he would deload with a 50% week. And then he would start again for the next four weeks, but he'd started about 85% of what he left off at uh, to peak, have its two, two peaks of strength, and then deload before he competed. And he only competed twice a year. And after competing, he deloaded and did hypertrophy training and took care of his body with uh, some of the, the various um, higher volume exercises, bodybuilding type work, more uh, VO2, uh, max improvement, cardiovascular stuff. And so that's just in terms of longevity and what I really tried to encourage Hawthorne to do. Uh, it was not to compete in, I think it was Europe's strongest man, which he won <laughs> right before he went to the world's strongest man. And then he competed in at least three more meets immediately after and, and much to my chagrin because I, I wanted him to, to shut it down. And um, finally, he, he did shut it down, and now you see he's just starting to ramp back up, and you've noticed some of his lifts recently. He squatted 970 the other day at 400 pounds with a six-pack, and that's because of uh, nutrition, which is kind of what I really wanted to hone in on today with, uh, with Hawthorne's program and Larry's. What can you change in your diet program? Uh, I kind of coined this term called vertical dieting, and it's not a diet. It's a philosophy, and whatever foods you eat, uh, and however much of them you eat, I try and use this philosophy uh, to pattern my diet programs. Hofthor's demands are obviously extreme, as will many of you powerlifting uh, have to take in an exceptional number of calories. How do you utilize those calories? How does your body efficiently digest and convert those into uh, the, the muscle that you want them to or the muscle glycogen? Um, and the way I do that is through vertical dieting. Hofthor previously on his horizontal diet was having IHOP for breakfast and uh, Subway um, meatball sandwich for lunch and pizza for dinner. That's just an example. Uh, Larry Wheels was much the same way. He was ended up, he would have, you know, burritos, a couple burritos for lunch and he would have probably IHOP. I don't know why that's the bodybuilder diet of choice, but <laughs> IHOP for breakfast, all these guys, IHOP, IHOP, IHOP probably for a cost per calorie effect that that's one of your biggest returns, I guess. But my point is not all calories are the same. And then, um, you know, he would end up with pizza for dinner or something like that as well. And I understand there's a cost component there. Uh, they're eating those foods because they, they get a lot of calories for the least investment and calories had historically been their priority. I tried to change that into the best quality calories and the ones that your body could get good at using, utilizing, eating, uh, and building over time. You can only eat so much pizza and so many pancakes before your stomach starts to reject and bloat and your body just gets confused by the whole process and you don't efficiently create the gut biome that I believe is necessary to, to use those calories and partition them correctly. Spending more time on the toilet. <clears throat> more time on the toilet. You don't necessarily use all the calories you eat. Some of them might just you know, pass through 
because uh, your body can't assimilate them. So that was one of the problems with Hofthor's diet, and that's why he was insulin resistant, that's why he was putting on more fat than he should have. Um, and so what we did is, first thing I had to do was get him healthy. And here's where you might have to take a step back. You might have to t you know, look at your blood test, analyze what your deficiencies are, remedy those, get your sleep fixed, uh, and then improve your insulin sensitivity. It's very, very important. People who are insulin sensitive tend to be able to utilize a lot of calories very efficiently and build a lot of muscle and strength with them. Uh, and Hofthor was, was insulin resistant at the time that, that we met. So the best way to do that is I took 20 pounds off him. I said, you gotta cut weight. You gotta cut back on your carbs a little bit, do a little more cardio. Let's get your system healthy again. Let's get it recognizing uh, the foods that you eat so it can utilize them better. So we took a little weight off, got him insulin sensitive, and then we went back at him with the vertical diet. I took away all the foods that <laughs> were causing the insulin resistance, uh, and I had him focus on foods that I thought he could really efficiently digest and utilize. The two biggies for me, <clears throat> the biggest bang for the buck, were steak, not hamburger, steak. I think one's better than the other. Uh, and white rice. Those were the two biggies. Those were the base of his diet. And I introduced just enough of them so he could get, you know, at the time for his training, adequate amount of protein and adequate amount of carbs. And then we filled in the gaps in terms of micronutrients with uh, efficiently digested uh, foods, extra foods. He could put eggs in there with breakfast if he wanted to. Uh, we added uh, oranges or orange juice to him. Uh, that was easy to digest, stimulated the liver, stimulated thyroid function, uh, really helped him, uh, his metabolism stay hot when he was eating that much food and training that hard. Uh, we threw in carrots daily for his fiber, uh, cooked vegetables such as uh, what I call low raffinose vegetables, which are vegetables that are low in, in oligosaccharides, so they're low gas, a lot of, don't have a lot of methane, so he wasn't bloated all the time. He found that but previously when he was eating the horizontal diet, he was constantly bloated, which is expected. If you're going to eat a lot of carbs, then it can't be the kind of carb that is difficult for your body to digest, and that's a lot of them. That's any of your wheat products, white bread, pizza. That's uh, even brown rice with the phytic acid in there, which is really difficult for your body to digest in quantity. And I had to get him to take in 800 to 1,000 grams of carbs a day. I got to make sure that his body can digest all that. Pasta, another thing, really difficult to digest in large amounts. You eat a big thing of pasta and you're just laying there like this, you know, for hours afterwards. But if you can gradually get yourself used to, to taking in the white rice, all of a sudden you don't have the bloat and you feel really efficient, and you digest it faster, and you can eat more sooner. And so we tried to introduce those kinds of things for him. Even beans with the, with the lectins, really hard to digest in quantity. So those lunchtime burritos you know, that you're eating, uh, that's the reason why you feel so uncomfortable for so long, and it's so hard to build on that. You, know, you, you can eat, only eat so much pizza, and then you're, you're full for hours. I want you to be able to eat a little sooner uh, frequency over quantity for me because I want your body to efficiently be able to digest the food that you're eating. So as we built his calories and we built these over time, we started with a certain calorie amount and this is something I, I got from Flex Wheeler which was very effective for me back in 2008. He would start with uh, you know maybe six ounces of steak, a meal, and a cup of rice. And after five meals a day, he said, okay, well, you know, hit me back when you're hungry. And as soon as a week or 10 days went by, all of a sudden, I was hungry an hour after I ate. My body was starting to get really used to that six ounces of steak and one cup of rice. And so then he said, okay, I want you to add a meal. And so we added a sixth meal. And then 10 days later, I was hungry again. And he said, okay, I want you to add two ounces of steak and half a cup of rice. And so I did that to each meal. And I was really full again. 10 days or two weeks later, all of a sudden, I'm really hungry again. I had no problem getting through that food and an hour later I was hungry again. So gradually I was able to build up more and more food and gradually building up more and more workload and volume in the gym so I'm able to train harder for longer, more often, recover faster, get more calories in, and the whole thing started ramping up together. And that's what we did with Hawthorne's diet and that's what we did with Larry's diet. A couple little cheat things that I did with them is post-workout, uh, we implemented um, 
uh, a carbohydrate load. This was, uh, uh, who's our boy with the UFC? Uh, Lockhart. George Lockhart uh, brought this to me a couple years ago. I worked with one of the greatest uh, nutrition guys in the UFC, which is George Lockhart. Uh, and he worked with uh, Conor McGregor recently for the McGregor fight. John Jones, uh, about a hundred other top UFC guys go to Lockhart. And he was um, in the military. He did uh, hydration for a battlefield, uh, getting out people who were dehydrated on the battlefield and getting them in medics, uh, as, worked as a medic. And so then the UFC brought him in uh, to help people with their water depletes and loads because they were worried about the athletes' health because the athletes were dying. Uh, and so he's really, really good about hydration. And part of hydration isn't just uh, the water, it was the minerals and electrolytes and the carbohydrates. And this is something that's, that's huge in terms of when I'm dealing with performance athletes. You can only take in so much protein and moving more protein probably aren't gonna get much more benefit out of that. You can only take in so many fats, at which point the extra fat's just gonna become fat. But in terms of performance, you can continue to load carbs and increase workload and build strength and size over the long term. That won't happen by increasing fat, that won't happen by increasing protein, to a point. Carbs seems to be, and this, hap this has been going on for decades in the bodybuilding industry, those people who followed Ronnie Coleman's career may have read uh, that he would eat from 800 grams to 1,100 grams of carbs a day uh, with Chad Nichols' diet program. Chad Nichols also worked with Flex Wheeler. I work with Flex Wheeler. So uh, these programs have been very effective for decades. I implemented a very similar program for Hofthor. We started bumping his, his carbohydrates up with these highly assimilable, uh, assimilable white rice primarily for his carbohydrate source, and he was able to, to utilize a lot of that. And we'd add carbs post-workout, and George Lockhart's little program was when you go in and have an a intense training session, leg day or something like that, or one of his athletes would go in uh, and do training in the morning, and these guys would do two-a-days. After that session, he wanted to replace everything that was lost, because that's how you're going to repair. When you can get a lot of water and a lot of sodium and a lot of carbohydrates and glycogen back into the muscles that you just use as quickly as possible, then you're gonna repair faster. You'll have less delayed onset muscle soreness, uh, and those muscles are gonna repair quicker. You can train sooner and heavier and harder. And it's also gonna improve your stamina and endurance for your next workout, significantly so. I know we've dispelled the myth of the post-workout window for protein, right? But with respect to carbohydrates, it is no myth. You will recover faster. You will have improved performance for your second bout. With you, with A lot of this making it sound tan. <laughs> and healthier is, is another thing that we experienced with Hofthor. When he was 420 and, and he wasn't able to add any more muscle, he was just fat. He was kind of, he, he, he was, he, he, it was his concern. He brought it to me. I'm, oh. you know, I'm just gaining fat, not muscle. He wasn't happy with his physique, the look of his physique. He's used to being pretty, pretty fit when he was lighter. Uh, but he needed to get stronger for World's Strongest Man. And that was a compromise that he made. But it wasn't nece didn't necessarily need to be made. He just went about it the wrong way. Just ate more food for the sake of more food. How long Take yeah, it was probably less than 45 days. The, the, the dropping the weight, crazy, yeah. regaining the insulin sensitivity, and then reinitiating the new diet uh, got down from 420 to 395. Started this new diet, and we brought him back up to 440 in better shape than he was at 420 and much stronger. Set PRs at the world's strongest man at the uh, Arnold, set a world record in the, in the throw over the bar. Uh, drastically improved his, his performance and strength as a result. The, and, and Mark's right. I did keto many times or a modified form of that throughout my career in bodybuilding, uh, but I was dieting down and strength wasn't a concern. Performance wasn't a concern, you know, in so much as uh, I needed to lift in the gym, I needed to lose weight and body fat and that compromised strength, always will. There's a certain point at which when you get to a certain body fat percentage as you get leaner, you're gonna start losing strength, it's just a fact. Um, and so the carbohydrates that I use are for performance and they're, they're for, they have a specific purpose post-workout, like Mark said, not only to get the glycogen rushing into the muscle that you just worked, but also the water that goes with it and the sodium. And you know what a huge proponent I am of, of sodium for performance. And that's an optimal time because your body, as you know, when you deplete it, it tends to supercompensate. it tends to soak up more of what it's uh, just been depleted. 
Uh, that's what we do when we deplete sodium and load or deplete water and then, uh, or carbs and then load. Your body super compensates and gets more. Post-workout's an opportunity to do that. George Lockhart put together a particular formula that works for a number of reasons. Uh, one, it's, it's multiple carb sources that are absorbed differently into the body. So he would put in, say, 50 grams of fructose, goes to the liver. 50 grams of dextrose is identical to glycogen, so it's absorbed straight into the bloodstream. Uh, at least 600 milligrams of sodium. I've done as much as 1,000, depending on the workout and the athlete. Just put salt in there and uh, 100 milligrams of caffeine post-workout. You just heard me say caffeine post-workout, not before, post-workout because it accelerates the uptake of all that water, all that uh, dextrose, all that fructose, all that glycogen into your muscles and all that sodium and super compensates. You feel euphoric, you honestly do, for an extended period of time after working out. You don't feel tired. And then if you come back four hours later, and I, I suggest, and it's uh, pretty common uh, in, uh, in the Eastern Bloc for powerlifting that you actually do a split uh, if the opportunity presents itself, and certainly in bodybuilding. Broke, broke hard in bodybuilding right? Yeah, I was training two-a-days uh, for a little shorter period of time, maybe 45 minutes at a shot rather than an hour and a half at once, because you can train long or you can train hard, but you can't do both. And my goal was, was intensity, not duration. I tried to do as much volume as I could in as short a time span as I could to recover quickly, get back and do it again. It's the law of repeated bouts. That's why I like to sleep more, eat more, so I can train more, because the law of repeated bouts says the more I can get in and train and recover from, and you can train as hard and as long and as often as that from which you can recover, uh, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to progress faster. And that, to me, is, is everything. It's just about optimizing all of that and recovering from it well and getting the hypertrophy benefit and the, the repair and the strength out of it. So that's one, another one of the key things that we did with Hawthorne was, was with, we focused on carbs uh, because his workload was so significant. I talked about this with Mark yesterday uh, in an interview. Nobody ever questioned when Michael Phelps came out and said he was eating 10,000 calories a day. Everybody thought that was really nifty, you know, because he's a swimmer and he's sleek and whatever, because he swims four or five hours a day. But if I tell you that, you know, a power lifter is eating 10,000 calories a day, it was like, oh, you know, the guy's going to die, whatever else. And it, a lot of the comments on Brian Shaw's video were like that. Yeah, and the fact of the matter is, and, and as I, in my recent video when I came out and said, if you want to be healthy, don't compete, the fact of the matter is, if Brian Shaw wants to be the world's strongest man, that's what he has to do. And sometimes it can be at the sacrifice of health. But being healthy and being fit are two very different things. I like... With Hofthor, I tried to get him as healthy as possible so I could get him as fit as possible, meaning prepared for his demands, his competition. Uh, and that meant to be as big and as strong as possibly can be. And that's the reason, and because I got him healthy first, he was able to get fit. And before he wasn't healthy, he wasn't able to get fit. He wasn't able to get as strong or as big or as muscular uh, or have the endurance or the stamina that he needed to compete uh, and win. So... Those are some of the key components that I throw into both of those. Larry was the same thing. A little secret I did with Larry is he was having a hard time eating. He had a hard time eating large quantities of food, and Hofflor benefited from this as well. So with his rice, I started having him sprinkle some dextrose, and they sell that on Amazon, I think Now brand or something, just has just pure dextrose. And he would sprinkle that on his rice. And it wasn't necessarily to add more carbs. It was because that would stimulate the saliva in the mouth, and next thing you know... He could eat twice as much rice just because he was still, well, it wasn't dry and he wasn't trying to gum it and chew it. Any video you see of, of well, even uh, Brian Shaw and, and uh, Scott Mendelson and, and the rest, Ronnie Coleman, you know, Jay Cutler, you see them eating those chicken breasts and they're just sitting there. I mean, I'm just exhausted. They're like, Ugh, dry food. So that was one of the tricks I used. And, and, you know, Larry went from, I think when he came out here, he was 255. And I think a few days ago when he pulled that 855, he's 275. And you saw him, he was just fit as can be, just abs blocked out. Same with Hofthor, squatted 970, six pack, 400 pound guy. And it was just that, I didn't even care about how much weight he lifted, just to see a 400 pound guy with a six pack. And to see Larry, that's, that's world in yeah. Itself. And Larry at 275 pounds, I mean, just rocked out. That's, you know, that's exciting to me. That's what I used to be able to do <laughs> when I was a younger man. Uh, and that's why I was able to do that, because that's the way that I ate. 
uh, with respect to the steak, everybody's always like, oh, I steak. Why squat when you can do a leg extension? You know, why eat steak when you can have chicken or whitefish? That's the comparison I make. It's just more nutrient dense. It has more iron, more B vitamins, more creatine, uh, zinc, magnesium, cholesterol, hugely important for uh, building and maintaining all the cells in your body. Every cell in your body has a fatty membrane. Uh, cholesterol is hugely important. It produces all the hormones in your body. And these aren't just the ones that some of us supplement. These are the more important ones, progesterone, pregnenolone, DHEA. All of those things are also affected by cholesterol consumption. And they all work together in concert. And in the absence of cholesterol, people who take statins have deficiencies in hormone production and get sicker, not healthier. So as an athlete, I want to do everything just the opposite of what the, the medical community has advised us of because that tends to break us down and make us weaker, and I want to get you know, bigger, stronger, faster. So really important uh, to look at it you know, as a whole. And uh, I know steak's more expensive. That's the number one complaint I get is, that, oh, God, the steak's so expensive. And it's like three times the cost of chicken. Well, there's a reason for that. It has three times the nutritional value. It takes longer. It eats more, drinks more. Uh, you know, it just it, it develops uh, a greater nutrient profile for you to then eat. A little chicken that's been alive for three months eating soy, and that's your main source of food, uh, probably not the best option. And I always say, you ever seen a big chicken? Yeah. Chicken's <laughs> neck versus a cow's neck. Yeah, that's, that's my first answer. Um, who was it that does the chicken shakes? Eric Poundstone. Derek Poundstone did the chicken shakes, and then uh, Blaine, Sumner. Blaine Sumner does the chicken shakes. Well, that's cool, but every other meal, if you look at Blaine Sumner's actual diet, is steak. He's chicken shake, steak, chicken shake, steak, chicken shake, steak. Uh, that's one of the biggest things that I do for athletes that, that they, they think I'm crazy especially parents with young athletes that I'm like, oh, you need to throw some bacon in with their breakfast. Uh, add some steak, you know, butter, get some cholesterol in them, get some high quality protein, nutrient dense, micronutrient dense proteins in there. They all improve performance. Between that and the sodium, they're blown away by the stamina, the endurance, the strength, the recovery ability. And this happens too when I could train bikini competitors. And I take away the white fish and I take away the broccoli and I give them some steak and their performance just improves overnight and their body composition starts to change. Yeah, what do some of these things do for their aesthetics? You know, because you're talking about performance, but- Increases lean body mass. Yeah, the harder you can perform, yeah. the better you're gonna look, right? Because in the physique world, bikini world, to me it's not about dieting and cardio, it's really about getting you know, the best sources of protein and to me the cholesterol, the micronutrients, the magnesium, zinc, uh, B vitamins uh, and creatine. And so I'll feed that to them and then I'll, I'll back off of the cardio and get them to train with weights twice a day. It's the way I used to prep for competitions. It's called body building for a reason, you know, not body shrinking. You don't cut away a bunch of calories and load in a bunch of cardio. That's another thing with Hofdor is we had to be careful not to send the wrong message. I wanted to make sure that if he was working on his VO2 max, his, his cardiovascular endurance, that we did that under load because as you know, you're, your fast twitch fibers and your slow twitch fibers, they can change. And if your goal is to be strong, you want as many fast twitch fibers as possible. And the way to change those fibers to the bad is to do a whole bunch of endurance work. Start doing 40 minutes on the treadmill. That's gonna start changing those fibers because they're gonna to adapt to the stimulus. That's what your body does, it adapts to the st stimulus that you provide. And anytime you start doing endurance cardio, like walking on the treadmill for 40 minutes, then your body starts to change. It says, damn, this muscle's heavy. It has a high oxygen demand. It has a high water demand. I gotta get rid of this muscle because this guy wants me to walk for an hour on the frickin' tre treadmill. So instead, that's why I start loading in the hit under load. Did the weighted carries, uh, some higher rep sets uh, until we get closer and closer to competition. Then we start pulling back on the reps even and just ride in on the heavy loading, uh, but fuel it correctly with uh, you know, those key ingredients. And again, I'm not anti-vegetable, I said eat vegetables, but I suggested a type of vegetable that doesn't compete with your primary goal, which is to absorb as much uh, you know, protein and micronutrients as possible 
So I'm using the low gas vegetables that don't uh, bind uh, to, to impede protein absorption or bind to va valuable minerals and electrolytes as loads of broccoli or uh, you know, lectin or phytic acid loaded carbohydrate sources would do. So I'm limiting those, they're in there for the health aspect, daily carrot for the fiber so that the toxins in your kidney and liver have something to attach them to to take them out of your system. Uh, the orange juice to stimulate the liver and the thyroid function as well. So all the nutrients are in there, and they're in there in, in, in the, uh, more than you need, really. Uh, and on that note, the reason I put those particular, uh, what I call accessories in there, is because they're pretty nutrient dense. A lot of people talk about the composition of, say, red meat, whether it's grass-fed or whether it's, uh, you know, uh, grown off of feedlot, they say, well, the omega-3s are better in grass-fed. Well, the percentage of omega-3s in red meat is so small that that's really not where you should be going looking for that anyhow. And the same thing's true of why I eat white rice instead of brown, not only because of the phytic acid and, and the difficulty of absorbing that much because of the, the, the problems with the gut, also because the nutrients, the additional nutrients that are in that brown rice are of such a minuscule amount that that's not where you should be looking for those. You can get a lot more somewhere else more efficiently. And that's why I put this diet together the way that I do, that, that very simple, vertically built, uh, you know, not terribly diverse <coughs> diet program is because it's effective and your body will utilize all those calories and then over time you can eat more and more, recover faster, train harder. Did I miss any key points? I don't think so. Uh, what do you think people should eat? Like some of the recommendations when you started over with uh, Pastor? <clears throat> I find the best protein source to be lean steak. People ask me about hamburger, and I'm like, well, it comes from so many places all over the cow, that it's kind of, and it might be higher in fat content. I've just noticed from experience with me and the athletes I've worked with that if you try and eat an equivalent amount of hamburger as you would steak, you don't tend to be able to handle it as well, and you don't tend to perform as well. It tends to kind of weigh you down. I think it has more to do with the fat content than anything else. Um, and with the steak, it's very lean. You eat it as soon as your body gets used to it and the, uh, digesting it, you can eat more and more and you just get leaner and stronger. It, it's, it's, it's just life changing. That goes on too. Maybe there's yeah, maybe you <clears throat> don't eat as much as you would with uh, you know, greasy hamburger type product. Uh, and that's, you know, my, that's why that's my primary protein source. Also because <clears throat> a lot of people are talking about these healthy fats and they end up adding in a whole bunch of vegetable oils polyunsaturated fatty acids, which we know oxidize, uh, which we know put off a lot of toxins in, uh, in the system. It's not a, a healthy compare. It's not even comparable. And I said in one of my rants, set a steak in front of me instead of a bowl of olives in front of me. Which one's going to make me bigger, stronger, and faster? That's my bro science. That's my common sense sort of comparison. But the science behind it supports it, that the saturated fats for uh, athletes and adolescents and children growing up uh, are better for building bodies and repairing them and strengthening cells and uh, uh, getting the vitamins uh, that's necessary into the cells. So those, that's why that's a key component for me. Um, and then I make sure and, and not to create any deficiencies. And it's more ni micronutrient dense. Steak is more micro micronutrient dense than a lot of other things. If you're a omega-3 fan, because I just talked about vegetable oils, and, and, uh, which I think are poison, that's not the place to look. Eat salmon twice a week. That's about the most omega-3s you're going to get, and it's the most utilizable, uh, utilizable form because most of these supplements, the vast majority, uh, are already exposed to light. They're already exposed to heat. They're already oxidized. The sourcing of them is a giant waste of money, and you end up pouring more um, oxidized polyunsaturated fatty acids in your body. And that stuff's absolutely poison. It's horrible. You can't build a body on that kind of stuff. And that is one of the primary problems why all of that horizontal dieting, I think, so hurt these guys when they tried to, to get to their peak performance is because they're eating deep fried fatty foods in those canola oil vats. Um, and a lot of that, most of that stuff that's at the store or anything in the grocery store, it's in a box or a bag, is usually soybean, soybean oil, uh, a lot of the hamburgers at, at fast food places are mixed with soybean because it's so cheap uh, as a filler. And so that's what you're eating. All these polyunsaturated fats with the fast food stuff. 
in, in the bread, all the breads that are at uh, Subway, um, all the foods that are cooked at IHOP are cooked in soybean oil and canola oil. That's not something that you want to be eating. That's not something that's going to build a strong body. Matter of fact, just the opposite. I think it's poisoning the body. So I try to eliminate all of that from their diet and get them to focus on those whole foods. Uh, the ones who can tolerate it, uh, whole milk is another good uh, protein source. And one of the big reasons behind that is, is because it doesn't slow the metabolism. Uh, fats and, and meats, they tend to slow the metabolism uh, a little bit although your workload will probably compensate a lot for that. But milk doesn't. Plus the casein at night before bed is really when I encourage the, the milk. The casein is broken down slowly overnight, so your, your body never wants for protein. And the lactose, the liver will convert that uh, and hold on to that for the brain to feed it at night. Because you uh, your brain doesn't stop. Your brain keeps consuming sugars all night long. That's its, its source of fuel. And if you wake up in the middle of the night, it's generally because your brain got hungry and it released a little bit of adrenaline and said, hey, I'm hungry. And then it starts releasing cortisol to break down muscle tissue, gluconeogenesis, and convert that into the carbohydrates that it wants to eat. So that's part of the problem uh, with your, might be part of the problem with your sleep and why you might need to get uh, something closer to dinner time to get you to sleep through the night, particularly if you exercise a lot and your body has a lot of uh, healing demands and it's utilizing a lot of those nutrients at night, uh, then it needs some extra. So those are fine to throw in if you don't have a lactose intolerance. There's nothing wrong with milk. It's great. We used to do the milk a day diet, a um, gallon of milk a day diet back in college because it was what we could afford and it was pretty damn effective for all those reasons. The casein, the saturated fat, the sodium, the vitamin D, the calcium, uh, hugely important with the minerals. Uh, I increased his sodium but we also uh, had him consume more calcium. And those two together, because the, uh, are very effective at stimulating the, 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 the thyroid function in the body, the metabolism in general, and repair. Uh, and also, when you get adequate calcium in, when you increase your sodium intake, it, uh, it helps with the pliability of the blood vessels and, and doesn't cause any increase in blood pressure, which has been largely overblown. Uh, so anybody who's already implemented sodium into their system knows it's something you should track, it's something you should add and monitor your results because it's a huge performance enhancer. Not just for stamina and endurance while you're training, but for recovery when you're done training. And it's more important than water in terms of hydration. Those people uh, who talk about hydration need a gallon of water a day. Well, there's no really research behind that. But the hydration experts, the PhDs out there that advise all the sports teams say what's really important is to have adequate minerals and electrolytes, to have adequate sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and so they make sure that, that that's in their diets. And if you're eating healthy, meaning you've eliminated fast food and you've eliminated packaged food in, you know, in the boxes and the bags in the stores, then your sodium are starting to go down. And you as an athlete actually need more, so you need to put it in. And you'll find that your performance improves considerably. Did I hit the big points? You want to open it up and see if we can find any... White rice in particularly, uh, potatoes tend to, it depends on which end of the spectrum you're on, potatoes tend to be high on the satiety index. It's another reason why I don't put um, uh, high oligosaccharide fibers in the athletes is because it's harder for them to eat as much food as efficiently when they're eating broccoli uh, because it, it takes so long to break down and it creates so much gas. Uh, that they can't eat as, as much as often. So I'm really doing just the opposite on the vertical diet. I'm trying to make things as, as streamlined as possible for the body. Potatoes, it's good food, but it's high on the satiety index. You can't eat as much as often because you'll stay full longer. But I do like, particularly with sweet potatoes, how loaded with uh, vitamin A and, and other you know, micronutrients they are, uh, if you need some of that. But the carrot also has the vitamin A in there. And so I have selected these items because the carrots uh, low raffinose, uh, whereas the sweet potato and the potato are, are high satiety. So I've kind of selected the items to, to help them eat more, more often because they need more fuel and without all the bloating and, and stomach problems. Uh, I implemented the 10 minute walks with them and I do it with people who are trying to lose weight and people who are trying to gain weight because it improved his insulin sensitivity, it decreased bloating, uh, it sped up digestion which then meant he could eat again sooner. And if I could get him eating more often, then the cumulative total of calories over the course of the day 
because the, remember the huge meals are a little less efficient. You stay full longer. Some of that stuff just gets passed through because you can't assimilate it. Um, uh, it just it bur bogs the system down, I think, as well as might create some insulin resistance. It's just, just sitting in there for so long. Uh, so I, I, the walks were hugely important to gain weight. I implemented the walks and I didn't lose weight. I, I gained weight because I was eating you know, above maintenance calorie and that's maintenance and that's what I had uh, Larry do as well. So it really helped. Sounds to me a lot. And, and for I think cooked spinach and cooked uh, peppers, red peppers, are two great ones. Uh, the carrot I throw in as well because it has some additional benefits. It's a naringenin, which is an estrogen suppressor. Uh, and uh, I think the fiber in there as well helps uh, the kidney and the liver attach some of those toxins too so it can have a, a ride out of the system. Otherwise, they'll just keep circulating in the absence. The fiber has an important, is an important part of this. I just try and keep it to such a degree that it doesn't impact negatively the other digestion. So those are the big ones for me. Squash, I, I don't know what your preference are. Um, when somebody like when Hawthorne comes to me for a diet program, I attach a list of those for him. Choose from these, you know, because they're low gas. Uh, there's another uh, FODMAP. Those of you who have heard of the FODMAP diet, and those are uh, foods that are um, oligo, disaccharide, you know, all of the, the gas-producing vegetables and foods. Uh, FODMAP breaks foods up into um, ones that are hard to digest, ones that are easy to digest. And that's kind of, I work off of that when I ask people to choose the types of foods they like to eat uh, as accessories, but I kind of stay focused with the steak and white rice for all the reasons I explained. And so you could just Google FODMAP and it'll give you that entire, has a whole list of everything you can imagine from proteins, carbs, and fats that will generally, that tend to cause uh, digestive issues and tend not to cause digestive issues. And then you'll have your own specific preferences over time. But that, that's kind of where I pull the foods from. Thank you. Yeah. Only the post-workout carb, um, sodium, caffeine drink in the absence of proteins and fats because it's so quickly assimilated and absorbed. That was the only one I really timed. And then I like to see him put something down before bed uh, for the reason I described, to have the casein protein there available in case there was any, so there was no deficiency overnight. And then the lactose, I thought, helped fed the brain food. So those are only real two timing methods. With as much food as he had to consume in a day just to support his weight and muscle and workload, he's probably eating every three hours at a minimum, you know? And it's not like, I'm not a big believer that, that three meals or six meals, if, if controlled for calories and protein, uh, is gonna make any significant difference. You know, we've seen that with studies over the years, but with an athlete who has to consume a lot of food, I used to have to wake up, uh, when I was training with Flex, I was eating eight meals a day. Uh, I'd have to wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning to get my first meal in and then go back to bed to get my next meal in. But I wouldn't set an alarm because I didn't want to wake myself up out of deep sleep. When I woke up at first in the morning, when I would normally kind of fall back to sleep or if I had to get up and pee or something, then I would have a meal. I didn't have an end table. I had a refrigerator. I had a little half fridge was, was my, next to my bed. And I would, I would get up, I'd go pee, and I'd open the fridge, and I'd already have something made. And I would just eat that, go back to sleep for a couple more hours, and then have my breakfast. Now I'm two meals in for the day. And that would go on throughout the whole evening until 10 o'clock at night when I went to sleep. So it, as, you, as your calorie demands increase, you'll find it takes a little more meals and a little more hours in a day to get it all in without having to overload your system with a whole bunch of stuff that, that suppresses appetite. You know, like a pizza would. Four or five hours later, you're still like, so. What else was next to your bed? <laughs> that was it. <laughs> I don't talk about that other story anymore. <laughs> no. The garbage can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sure enough. Flex had me drinking so much water, especially as you got closer to competition, that if you got up in the middle of the night, so I didn't have to get up and walk to the bathroom and come back, I had one of those little Rubbermaid kitchen garbage cans. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So all I had to do was turn sideways and then I'm back in bed. And the worst part is, is I was staying in a hotel, and sometimes I'd forget to empty it. The cleaning lady would come in while I was at the gym. I felt so bad for her. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Something's better than nothing. And this was, you know, had been drilled into me for years and years since college when I used to put PB&Js in my backpack to get to class. 
or uh, uh, hard-boiled eggs and chicken. Imagine what that smelled like when I popped that Tupperware open in the middle of class and everybody was like looking back at me and eating. Uh, something's better than nothing. And when I was at uh, University of Washington, I had a quarterback that I was training. I took him up there, a young guy, and the, the, the trainer up there said the same thing to his days. Look, you know, something's better than nothing. If you guys got to pack PB&Js, don't be hungry. And when you're trying to grow, uh, don't be hungry. That's my patent response for shakes. Uh, I never drank any because I ate my food, because I thought steak was better than a shake. And I still believe that in terms of optimizing, you know, everything, and that's what I'm trying to do. I try and put forth, here's the best, good, better, best. Here's the best you can do. And then, you know, if you fall off here and there, something's better than nothing. But I wouldn't plan for meal shake, meal shake, like some people do. That, that wouldn't be my design. It might happen if you're traveling or if you're absent a meal or you're somewhere you can't get, have it handy. That's, that's, I think, and Jay Cutler said it too, he could never gain or maintain a significant amount of muscle on shakes. He ate a lot of steak, ate a lot of chicken, you know, whatever he had to eat. But, uh, and then the second question, what was that one? Oh, there's some great resources out there. Um, you know, as far as on the diet stuff, I think Gary Taubes, good calories, or good calories, bad calories, I think is what he calls it. Uh, Gary Taubes, has, is probably one of the best scientific research journalists out there. And he has a number of books, uh, the new ones on sugar, another extraordinary book. Uh, if nothing else, whether you agree or disagree with his philosophies, he goes through almost the chronicles, like a hundred years history of research, political, the, the process by which we make decisions about, you know, proteins, fats, and carbs, and what's happened uh, both in terms of the scientific research and in terms of, of uh, what's happened with our uh, uh, government and, and the proposals that they've made and, uh, you know, the American Heart Association and why they act the way they act and uh, the influences of, of uh, big businesses on all of that, you know, whether it's, and they're all big businesses, whether it's canola oil or whether it's, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> sugar, craft foods, you know, uh, and I'm not a big conspiracy theorist, theorist guy, but they're businesses, they're, they're pursuing their own best interests, and a lot of the research that comes out tends to be biased towards uh, the party that, that's to benefit the most. But Gary Taubes, that's a, one of the best resources. And then online, anybody who hasn't tuned in to Greg Knuckles' stuff should. He gets a lot of good stuff together. Obviously, Mark's put out a ton of content and had a lot of great people here. If you want to read um, articles, then I think that's a great, a great resource is Greg's Knuckles stuff. On Amazon, you can just order a tub of uh, dextrose. You can order a tub of fructose. You can order, uh, I get thermo tabs. They're just salt tablets. And I'll just, I'll break up three of them and throw them in the, in the drink. And they're like 300 milligrams of sodium a piece. And then maybe some no-dos uh, 100 milligram tab of no-dos. Uh, how you flavor that is up to you. Sometimes I'll take half the fructose out and put in orange juice, a no-pulp orange juice, and that's my flavor, and I'm good. You mix orange juice, Gatorade, yeah. right? Put in two noon tabs because they're about 250 milligrams or, or so a piece of sodium, 300 milligrams of sodium. Right. So two of those would be 600 milligrams of sodium and 100 milligrams of caffeine. The only thing about noon tabs is their sodium... Orange juice is so good. Yeah. Noon tabs is sodium bicarbonate, and the only challenge with that is sometimes that can irritate your stomach. Uh, if you've ever tried that for uh, battling lactose, or for, you know, it, uh, the more you use, the, the more it bothers your stomach. <laughs> Time you get to an effective dose. Uh, Mark and I have been working on putting together our own little formula with George Lockhart. We talked to him about it. Been, it's just a matter of trying to, like you say, find something that's flavorful. That, you know, but that's what I'm doing now. I just blend all that together and I take it to the gym and I drink it as soon as I'm done training. And I don't drink it terribly fast because it is a lot of sugar. Uh, uh, George Lockhart, in his um, refeeds, after somebody loses all of their water weight and weighs in, the second they step off the scale, when you saw Conor McGregor step off the scale, that's what they handed him, was that exact drink. And 30 minutes later, one more but he would take at least 10, 15 minutes to drink the first one, about 10 minutes to sip it. 
and that way it won't irritate your stomach. I haven't had much problem with it because it's just, you know, dextrose, fructose, sodium, and caffeine, and I, I drink it after my workout. I feel great. It's almost euphoric. After a huge leg workout of 20s, and you sit down, and you're like, just beat, you drink that, and you're like, wow, this is great stuff. I almost felt like I injected it. 